um, I'm going to talk a little bit. If you read the description in the newspaper of what I was going to talk about, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Indivisible at the beginning and then perhaps have time to talk about it a little bit at the end. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions on it. But I was talking with my, my co-facilitator of Indivisible and we sort of felt as though, well, if you want to know about Indivisible, you should come to an Indivisible meeting. Um, but briefly, if you don't know what Indivisible was or is, it was an organization that was started after the 2016 election, um, the days following it by congressional staffers who basically put together a 60-page document that said, if you want to stop the disastrous agenda which is coming our way, this is how you are going to have to go about it. It detailed how to make phone calls, how to put pressure onto your members of Congress, how to, how to make visits to their offices, these sorts of things. Essentially, people power updated to 2016. They took a lot of their influence from the Tea Party. They said the Tea Party has been very successful in this country at, at electing Republicans on, at every level of government and, and essentially being clearing the way to be able to put in, um, I'm actually not allowed to say uh, the president's name in my house, uh, so we, we call him Voldemort. Um, so I may refer to Voldemort a few times by accident, but, uh, but you know who I'm, who I'm talking about. Um, Indivisible has since evolved past that idea of using Tea Party tactics and we're developing our own tactics. There are over 6,000 chapters now in the United States. It's by far has become the largest progressive organization um, in, in the country, although we're still growing, we're still, we're still evolving. Obviously we have our attention paid to 2018 um, and to the November election. Very specifically, we have a lot of attention that we're focusing on, on, um, on Bruce Poliquin and replacing Bruce Poliquin. And we're part of a national strategy, part of the 435 strategy to take back the House. It's incredibly important that we take back the House because that's where, the, that's where Mueller's report will land when, when he gives a report. And that's where articles of impeachment will begin. Without owning the House, without owning the committees, the Mueller report might as well not even be submitted because it will be um, Trey Gowdy and Paul Ryan or whoever put, replaces Paul Ryan will politely put it into a drawer and we will never actually see it. So it's incredibly important that we, we here in the CD2 take, get rid of Poliquin, not only because he's a do-nothing representative and not only because he's, he's useless and refuses to meet with his, with his constituents. Um, one of our first actions in Indivisible was occupying uh, Poliquin's office politely every Thursday we'd go there with lunch uh, all last or a year ago last fall after the election into the winter we went there every Thursday sat in his office for an hour until he moved his office he moved his office now to a place which is um, non ADA accessible that is it's up a flight of stairs and then down a flight of stairs so if you are in a wheelchair or on crutches it's very difficult to meet with meet with anyone, any staffers in Poliquin's office. Not only that, he to, to make matters worse, he locked the door. His door is permanently locked. You can't get in without an appointment. I try to schedule appointments. I never I never get an answer back. It's a very effective way of governing, according to Poliquin. Another reason why we have to take it back. Um, so if you want to come to an Indivisible meeting, we have two coming up. We meet at the Blue Hill Wine Shop normally, either that or the Blue Hill Library. Uh, on July 10th, we'll be talking about our endorsements. Uh, we, just sent out of a, we just sent out a poll. Some of you who are part of Indivisible received that poll. Um, and we are endorsing Jared Golden. A provision there, I should say. One of the reasons why in... One of the ideas behind Indivisible is basically we have to staunch the bleeding of the 2016 election. Jared Golden is not my first choice. Um, uh, Mills is not my first choice for, for governor. I doubt she's the first choice for many people in this room. She was only about 28% of the first choices of Democrats in, in the state. Uh, but what we need to do is, is push back. Uh, we need to get Democrats in so that we can start leaning on Democrats and pushing them to the left. 
This is the basic indivisible strategy. Sometimes I really am into it. Sometimes I'm, I'm a little hesitant about it. What it's meant is having to shelve a lot of progressive politics in order to get people in. This is what the Tea Party did. They took Republicans, whatever Republicans, got them into office, and then started to lean on them to push them to the right. It was a very effective strategy. If they had been trying to lean on Democrats, if the Tea Party was trying to lean on Democrats, they weren't going to get anywhere. The same goes if we're going to try to lean on Poliquin or try to lean on Susan Collins, we're not going to get very far. If we get a Democrat in, if we get, if we get the House, if we, if we take back the Senate, we can start to lean on these Democrats who we've put into office uh, as part of Indivisible, and we can really start to push them in a more progressive direction, in a direction that we might find, be more comfortable with. So, leaving aside Indivisible for now. Um, July 10th at the wine uh, I'm shop. sorry, yes, sorry, um, my apologies. Uh, July 10th at the wine shop uh, at 7 p.m. We're going to be talking about that uh, and talking about our endorsements. And July 21st, also at the wine shop, also at 7 p.m., we have John Rennish, whose parents live on Deer Isle. He's a Democratic strategist. He was, uh, he was closely tied in with the Hillary Clinton campaign. He now is a writer and, and is working for, for a number of different Democratic organizations to get them elected. He'll be coming at 7 p.m. and talking about strategies to go forward. Um, so two meetings, July 10th and, and July 21st. If you're interested in getting in touch with me directly or, or our co-leaders of Indivisible, we've got five co-leaders, um, write to indivisiblepeninsula at gmail.com or you can just write to me at nicojenkins uh, at gmail.com. Um, either one will, will get to us. Uh, so, leaving aside that, while I was trying to frame the idea of this talk, um, I went back and forth a little bit about how to talk about it, to talk about democratic strategy, to talk about strategy in the, in the face uh, of Trump, or also to start talking from a more personal standpoint, and that standpoint is the uh, standpoint of, of um, where we are today and, and how we're to go forward. So I started writing something, and this is a work in progress, and it's called 11 Approaches to the end of the world. And, uh, hi, do you want to come in and join us? Uh, and I'm going to read some of this, or a lot of this, because of, of the way I was writing and the way I was thinking. So my apologies to you if you wanted a more roundtable discussion. This is not the talk you came to see, which was meant to be on indivisible and activist responses to the crisis this country faces, and I apologize for that. But for that talk, you needn't have come, and I needn't have done it. The collective energy and experience that I imagine exists in this room right now dwarfs what I could say after 18 months of helping to lead a small progressive group on a peninsula in Maine. If we want to know about activism, we should just be quiet and listen to the elders around us. And if they're already dead, then we should listen to the shadows and echoes of those elders. Gathered in this space with people who knew the nearings or people who came here to Maine because of their writings is humbling. Scott and Helen Nearing, as we just heard, imagined a different life, a retreat from a dying social order, and then fought and sacrificed for it, flourishing, it would seem, on the edge of the sea and on this land. Perhaps we already know what we need to do. The path is well trod if we look for it. In the Eight Principles of Uncivilization, a piece of writing that marked the beginning of the Dark Mountain Project in the UK, and which served as a rallying cry for artists and writers tired of a politics of environmentalism, which seems in itself exhausted, poet turned philosopher Paul Kingsnorth an activist and organizer, Dugald Hine, wrote that we will not lose ourselves in the elaboration of theories or ideologies. Our words will be elemental. We write with dirt under our fingernails. I can't think of a better up-to-date description even of the nearings and what their project was here. 
Marx says something similar when he writes that up to now the philosophers have only examined the world. The point, however, is to change it. Given that, and given that we know already that if we want to be activists, and if we want to change the world, then we should just be active and change it, I wanted to take the chance tonight to give a different kind of talk. It might be a performance if I'm lucky. It might be a failure too, but given the seriousness of what we're facing in the political sphere, and the immediacy that the climate emergency calls us to, I thought I would take that risk. If I fail, I will have failed because I took a risk. But if I have legitimately and authentically taken a risk, then I won't have failed. In the face of the apocalypse, the gesture, authentic, ambiguous, is all we may have left. As an aside, the apocalypse is not necessarily what we have come to anticipate, that is, a cataclysmic event. That modern definition did not exist until recently. The apocalypse of the climate emergency or of politics can be seen as a revelation and an uncovering of what was already, always already here, always already latent in our world. From the Greek apo meaning off, away, from, plus kaliptein, which means to cover, conceal, or to save, the apocalypse of our time is an uncovering and a revealing of a trouble that cannot be ignored any longer, cannot be pushed away. As a revelation, it is an unwakening to, and in this sense, even the apocalypse becomes an opportunity to turn to face that which we have so easily ignored for far too long. Instead of the talk I was going to give, I'm going to read from a work in progress called 11 Approaches to the End of the World. I won't read all 11, and I'm not actually sure whether in the final work there will be 11 in the end, or 17, or even 72. Approach number one, standing in. The end of the world is sudden and meets me on a beach at sunset as I harvest seaweed to fertilize my garden in the early spring. Rippled, low-tide sand meets a thin, still band of steel-colored water. The rockweed is gathered by the retreating water in a wide pile about midway down the tide line and mounds up, tidally collected every 12 hours or so. From here, I can see 2.9 miles across the open water before the earth warps matter away from me. The limit of my world is decidedly close by. Four miles or so above me, depending on the seas in the sky, begins first as a boundary layer of the troposphere. Beyond that, the atmosphere starts in earnest, and beyond that, even, the empty maw of space, which recedes rapidly away from me in an explosion 14.5 billion years old and not yet cooled. My vision is queerly limited, and a shift happens from seeing things as they seem to be, the ocean curving away in front of me, to a sense of things delayed, of being in a time lapse of some sort. The seaweed, once gathered, is scattered again over bare earth. Covered in straw, it rots first as slime and goo, and then as brown, black earth under a layer of straw. That in turns become that in turn becomes the first peas that I harvest on the unseeded land I build my house on. That we build our house on. Didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> in fact, we harvested some peas just yesterday. I approach the end of, of the world in two ways on this beach, and within these boundaries of vision and space. In the first, this beach feels an end point, a boundary between me and sea, a stopping and pausing. From here, I can go no further. Somewhere between me and the water, there is a limit and an end. And in the second, a feeling of awe overtakes me, cripples me, if just for a minute, at the thought that the climate emergency could actually be the end. Not in some distant future of grandchildren I have yet to meet, but right now that the process of undoing has already begun, that we are already undone. From here, again, I can go no further. The sun's light hits the earth, traveling at 186,000 miles a second, eight minutes and 20 seconds after it leaves the surface, if there is a surface of the sun. Looking at the sunset, I'm already looking back in time, no longer in the present, but in the past. Regal rising after sunset in the constellation of Orion and the seventh brightest star in the sky is more distant 
but is still the closest star to us beyond the sun. The light, which is actually two stars locked in a perfect gravitational duel, is 4.2 light years old. I look further back in time. The most distant star's light, which only our most sophisticated arrays can see, from MACSJ1149, also known as Icarus, is over 9 billion light years distant. Its light reaches us, but only just, and then highly dated. If it exploded 8 billion years ago, we won't know that for another billion or so. The 2.9 miles of the distant horizon has suddenly turned into a temporal dimension, moving from measurable linear distances to distances of light and speed and time, distances which become unrecognizable and therefore unknowable, at least to me. The time of my existence on this land, the age of modern human beings, our contemporaries, the age of homo sapiens, the age of invertebrates, the age of basic life forms, the age of the planet, the age of the universe. All of these times are available on the internet through Wikipedia and don't need to be listed here, but still they are on a fundamental level unknowable. Time as a limit always pulls away from me. The end of the world, the horizon limited by the Earth's curvature, has always been close by, while it has been always already distant. The end of this world, however, the possible end of all this, comes as a sudden surprise, though for millennia we have heard rumors. It seems we have little time left before the ice sheets melt and the oceans acidify and the deserts grow near. It's already happening and has been for some time. The rude shock of refugees and migrants filters up from our southern borders, infecting our days. We are conscious and become conscious. And ethics is born here with this word on loan from the Greek synodesis, which means literally with knowledge. With knowledge, we become aware of a world suddenly at hand. The age of the Anthropocene may have begun just recently, or in 1945, or 1850, or 10,000 years ago, but it is now no longer a distant threat to our children's children. We inhabit that threat now, and we do not change. Approach number two, grief inquiry. I don't understand this word grief, and I'm not sure anyone really can. If grief is the disassembling of one's known world, the breaking apart and dissolution of the concrete, to name it is to begin to make a claim on it. It seems that to describe grief is immediately to contextualize it, to place it within a discrete container until such a time as one chooses to encounter it. Grief is a word like empathy, amorphous and with a vague hint of something that makes us somehow human or more human, but it resists precision. Siddhartha Gautama, known as the Buddha, tells a story of a woman searching for someone to bring back her dead son. The Buddha tells her to go to the nearest village and borrow rice from someone who has not experienced loss. I take loss to mean grief, and of course no one can give her even a grain of rice because everyone by being sentient and alive has felt grief, has experienced loss. So grief is something we experience. It is what makes us human. And when I consider that all this, all this life and surging forth and everything that is, is threatened by the climate emergency, I feel grief certainly. I feel deeply, inconsolably sad as though I've walked up to the edge. It is not true, however, as I just wrote that I'm inconsolable. Because just as quickly I turn away from the edge of the ocean, away from the cliff, away from the thought, thought too darkly, and I turn home towards dinner, towards my children and my wife, towards contemplating the new iPhone or Supreme Court justice, or just simply turn away. Grief is contextualized and emplaced, walked away from too easily as soon as it comes too near. And grief is perhaps something modern too. Did we evolve with grief? Or is grief what comes with thinking that somehow we can choose what to lose and when? Does grief arrive at the same moment of free will? Is grief a choice or something akin to our heart beating? We can hear it if we choose to, but too often we are too busy to listen. And I turn towards grief as a practice, trying to understand it, knowing that somehow I have a duty to and should. 
I seek to expose myself to the pain of grief, to the very real possibility that in the age of climate's emergence into our consciousness, that there is a world, that this world is tired and damaged and perhaps won't recover, that this emergence comes too late and that this should be a moment of profound life-altering grief. And of course, it does make me more human, and it does, at the edge of aloneness, as David White puts it, somehow open me to something larger. But just as quickly I resist this, I must turn towards home, away from the abyss, towards dinner again. Flying over the Greenland ice sheets a few weeks ago to Oslo from Boston, and the brief night of the summer solstice breaks in a rosy dawn, from 37,000 feet, I look down on the mass of ice, slowly, inexorably moving into the sea, a literal manifestation of Dogen's blue mountains constantly walking. The vast, inexpressible, static energy of the ice sheet, energy as potentia and held in frozen abeyance, becomes slow rivers of ice inexorably moving towards fluid ocean melt is a story of climate change. To experience this from altitude is intoxicating. It places you within that moment, if only. It places you within that movement, if only for a moment, and not apart from it. And I am a part of that change in nearly everything I do. My flight to Oslo and back is responsible for, according to a recent study in science, the melting of three square meters of the Arctic. <clears throat> I come to know grief and with it responsibility through that slowly shifting weight, that ancient mass transformed. Approach number three, walking. I don't walk enough, but I spend an awful amount of time, an awful lot of time online, haunting Google Earth, looking at empty landscapes and imagining walks across them, sudden traversals, interruptions, incisions across an open field. I have always sought the lonely, the separate, the edge of the known. Driving back and forth across this country over the last 40 years, I seek out the loneliest motel, never the chain, the one run often by the deterritorialized de immigrant, themselves cast away somewhere just off the 40 or 10, with stains on the walls and the memory too soft, uh, and the memory of the last occupant still lingering reluctantly in the air, and carpets that are slightly sticky and too soft at the same time. I imagine holding up there and writing a novel, something about the loneliness of the world that I've created by holding up there. David Wojnaritz opens his close to the knives with a memory of his own conception on a bed in a room while the curtains are being sucked in and out of an open window by a passing breeze. I hadn't read that passage for 20 years, and somehow I had transposed it as a memory of a motel with dreams of strangers infecting the drapery. In reality, what the passage describes is far nicer than what I have been seeking in motels. Now, though, I do more walking and thinking about walking. The artist Richard Long's work is about walking, or takes place through a walk. His work, which takes the form of either a series of poems, wall writings, and even installations of mud and stone, are an unfolding and exploration of space, of movement across and between geographical formations. Some of his titles are A Circle of Midday, Walking 360 Miles Around a Circle, 1997, A 15-Day Walk in the Three Sisters Wilderness, 2001, a walk of 279 miles northwards and southwards, out and back on the same road, eight walking hours each day, 1991. There's something spectacularly dull about these titles, long trudges through bracken and empty space, but there's something holy and nearly mystical about them as well. Dugald Hind, already mentioned, a writer associated with the Dark Mountain Project in the UK, described in a conversation with the anthropologist David Abrams his interest in ancestral actions. These actions are the same actions undertaken by our ancestors with very little change in their basic movement and function through the generations. Most of what I did today, driving, checking my phone, loading the dishwasher, was not informed by movements or thought patterns that anyone 200 years ago, let alone 500 or 5,000, would have recognized. Walking, however, is, diff is different. Our ancestors come to know the world through walking it, whether via song lines or trade routes or paths to water. 
and in a very real way our thinking evolved out of the linearity of such paths. We have evolved to know the world and the time it takes to cross a field, ford a stream, or climb a mountain. Richard Long's passages work this way. They are an unveiling, apocalyptic, a slow traversal and a reading of the world, albeit in and through a language we are no longer accustomed to speaking. There is a walk I want to take, but I will take. It runs east to west over 12 days along the southern edge of that Greenland ice sheet. There are no villages along the way and the landscape is empty and open. On your right, the vast ice sheet in places a mile or more thick. To your left, tundra and open ocean. It will be a walk of mourning and grief. Perhaps I will understand grief then. An opening and witnessing to the event that threatens to define our age, the vast inexpressible melting of the ice. The act of walking is a repudiation then of the last 300 years, a severing of ties with what French philosopher Paul Virilio calls a techne of speed. In slowing down, in walking a line for a mile through a meadow or forest or 10 days across recent moraines, the world emerges in its slowness. It unfolds and expl explicates itself. To walk to a glacier and to touch it is to touch time. It is to destroy the alienation and separation brought on by 300 years of Cartesian surety. It is to come close to the planet again, even while acknowledging it is too late. One more. Approach number six, swimming. Some years ago, I sailed from the east coast of the United States to England in a small boat of 26 feet. Somewhere around halfway across, after moving through the tail end of a hurricane, we stopped to repair our, sail our sails, which had ripped in the high winds. The process of hand sewing the tears took about 24 hours, during which time we were adrift. During that time, and while looking at the chart, I noticed we were in one of the deepest parts of the North Atlantic, a region just south of the Somme Abyssal Plain. Realizing that I would likely never be in water so deep, I decided to go for a swim. I tied a rope around my ankle in case of encountering a sudden current and jumped overboard. The terror I felt immediately was profound. Below me, the ocean fell away to 2.5 miles. In that instant, I felt myself surrounded above me, as around me, as below me, by a spherical horizon, naked but for my tether to the boat. I knew then that if for some reason I should drown there, it should have taken days for my body to, take, to make its way to the bottom. In that time, I would not have been fully dead, for my body would not have reached its final horizon, its final resting place on that abyssal plain. But I would not, for obvious reasons, have been still alive. As a child, I fell in a well and remained stuck for an hour or more, I can't quite remember, until some farmers happened to hear my calls for help. I remember the day had been extremely hot. So my parents were eating lunch in a restaurant connected to a courtyard where the well was. Considering how long the lunch went on for, this was the 70s, they had lost track of time and of me. The well itself opened up into a cistern underground and a pipe ran along one side of it. It was there where I held on. The deep cold of the spring-fed water contrasted sharply with a bright, dusty day outside now reduced to only a bright circle 20 or 30 feet above me. At five, I already knew how to swim, and as I paddled around, I called out in the only Italian word I knew, the word for help, aiuta, aiuta. I don't remember fear, but now as a parent, thinking back on it, it takes my breath away. Though I had not put it together until I wrote this, the loneliness of being abandoned in a well is a similar feeling to what I felt as I floated two and a half, mi two and a half miles above the abyssal plain. I feel a similar terror when listening to David Bowie's Space Oddity, Oddity from 1969, in which Major Tom, orbiting somewhere far above the moon, encounters a problem and begins to float away into the eternity of endless space. His final words are, I'm feeling very still, and I think my spaceship knows which way to go. Planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. The feeling of helplessness, of being captured within a, source of, within a force of nature, whether at the bottom of a well floating over a deep abyss or, as I imagine it, 
drifting away into outer space is perhaps not only horrifying, for it is that, but also intoxicating. There is a feeling of liberation or an unmooring from the responsibilities of known life. And this feeling is not unlike standing on the precipice of a very tall building in that suddenly it is all very clear. To be free from the endless weight of living life of intentionality and to instead be subsumed into something larger, not God, something stronger than your fragile life is nothing short of metaphysical. It is an acknowledgement of Freud's death drive, perhaps, an unmooring from the known into the unknown. The Anthropocene, climate change, seems to work this way too, or it has the potential to. To truly turn yourself towards the enormity of the crisis, to acknowledge that, the, that all this may be over, is not to give up in despair, though that risk is there. It is, to potentially, it is potentially a feeling of deep freedom, a creative surrendering which strengthens instead of diminishing. How long can we turn away from the knowledge of our own limits before we cannot turn away any longer? Like feeling the immensity of water below me as I glided over the abyssal plain, in facing the immensity of the crisis, I am, perhaps only for a minute, liberated from an inauthentic feeling of permanence into a very real, almost delicious sense of impermanence. Approach number nine, activism and engaged life. This was meant to be a talk on activism, and arguably, obliquely, it has been. But I wonder what it means to be active and to call oneself an activist. Like grief, it seems like I'm always pulled towards home, pulled away from an active engagement with the world, towards comfort, toward the known and predictable. Calling my senators, joining a crowd briefly occupying a cold square for a few hours, and writing letters to the editor, all activities I have been engaged in over the last 18 months seems to me precisely by definition to be the very least one can do. And it is an awareness of this that has made me so hesitant to speak of activism tonight. In 1947, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a short essay called What is Literature for Les Tons Modernes, in which he called on the writer to be socially and politically engaged with and within their world. <coughs> Sartre claimed that engagement is an ethical and political virtue which begins from the premise that we are each necessarily situated in particular places and times. While he was speaking first of the writer and the writer's call to act in such a way that nobody can be ignorant of the world and nobody may say that they are innocent of what it's all about, and that's a quote, we can read in Salt, as he indeed later did, an implication of all humans to take part in their lives, to seize and to hold one's responsibility dearly, and to take up the challenge of engagement. The unique situation that we find ourselves in, this crisis, this apocalypse, becomes a call toward our ethical selves. It is indeed the beginning of an ethics. The call is a call which engenders and requires a response. To ignore it, to not answer that call, places us, as South writes, in a position of profound bad faith and inauthenticity. We exist today on a precipice, though too many ignore it. But we have existed here for a long time. The crisis of Trump is not new. His appearance is something old and ever-present in our America, a symptom and a shadow which we have denied and which came surging back however many months ago. If we refuse the call to live an engaged life, if we turn away from the crisis too quickly or refuse even to approach it, our lives will always be false, always be half-lived. The opportunity of the apocalypse, again an unveiling and revealing of what is at stake, is a chance to respond to a world in crisis. It is too easy, delightfully so, to turn away to turn again towards home or the closest bauble held up by late capitalism as must-have jewel. I feel for my iPhone. But when we do so, we do so at the forfeiture of our lives lived wholly, enmeshed within a world rather than without it. I'm going to conclude, but I just have a brief quote from Scott Nearing's book, The Conscience of a Radical. I read a long time ago. Yeah. I found it here. I thought I could use it. Creative man can follow such a course only by continuously breaking the shell of custom 
and rejecting obstructive habit patterns. As he proceeds, he must stand erect, face his task with eyes wide open, and move forward in the pursuit and fulfillment of his purposes. We might have written that a little differently in this age to be more inclusive. But I feel that that same energy to look forward, to lean into this difficulty, that the crisis of climate change, that the crisis of Trump, that the crisis of all of these things that we're met with are also an opportunity for us to stand tall, to push into them, to not turn away, to not turn towards home too quickly. A conclusion. The reality is that for most of us in this room who have a 401k or a bit of money tucked away in a mutual fund or municipal bond, we've seen our net worth increase under Trump. Our lives, by at least some objective economic marker, have improved in the last 18 months. This is hard to deal with. If we can still afford organic milk or to fly somewhere like Oslo, crossing international borders with no more concern than if we manage to get a good deal on a ticket or a deal on our miles, we are in good shape. Consider the Syrian seven years in a civil war making his way across ten borders only to be returned to Damascus on a short three-hour flight, or the resident of Gaza and Palestine born into a prison some 40 years ago and still imprisoned by a foreign occupying power, unable to move, unable to live as a human being. Consider, those, consider, too, those who show up on our southern border, fleeing a world most of us cannot imagine, even when we travel there. Our blue passport, no matter how ashamed some of us may currently be of it, is always a license to leave, to pass over, to turn towards home again. With this license, however, comes a great responsibility, vast and untamable. The knowledge that I can never do enough is impossible to hold, and yet, from my position of gross comfort, I must. This is our existential demand. This is our call from this time, from this place to this time and place. Russian philosopher and novelist Nikolai Chernyshevsky asked in 1863, what is to be done? The I. Lenin later took up this question and it continues to haunt any thinking of ethics, any thinking of taking action today. This is our dilemma to find out what then we must do and then to do it. I can't answer it for anyone, much less for myself. Furthermore, to do so would be to risk committing even greater crimes than have already been committed. Salt would say we must be committed and remain engaged. We face a terrible crisis in our time, but as a society, we have faced worse. To draw close to the crisis, to draw close to the call is perhaps all we can do, or at least to begin, to stay, as cultural theorist Donna Haraway puts it, with the trouble of living and dying and struggling together. It is, as already mentioned, too easy to look away. Everything in our society suggests we should and that we will live better, fancier lives if we do. Only we know that we won't. I suspect this is the truth for most of us in this room. Only we know that we won't, that a life of distraction never fulfills. Haraway pulls us closer to the trouble, for this is where we will begin to lay the groundwork for a more complete life. It is an action away from the internet, away from Netflix and Hulu and the latest headlines, away from, from Voldemort. It is on the beach, standing in at the edge and the end of the world, leaning towards the abyss rather than away from it, leaning into the trouble where we begin. Thank you very much. for coming tonight. Thank you. If anyone has questions about Indivisible, precisely, I'm happy to answer them either in this forum or in the kitchen over popcorn and tea. Or some other questions. Or some other questions, too. I can answer other questions. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, it was maybe a comment. Um, the comment is, I, I, I don't share your pessimism in some ways, but I think the situation is much worse than you stated. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Um, I mean, it's when we talk about climate change, it, it is a problem like no other that mm -hmm. we've ever encountered. It's there. There is no solution. It's just how bad will it be, mm -hmm. and how soon. Um, it's that bad. Mm -hmm. It's not like you could make reparations to 
you know, rape in Africa or something. Mm -hmm. If we really wanted to, we mm -hmm. could. Mm -hmm. But we can't make reparations for climate change. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's not going to happen. So it's, the situation is very dire. But at the same time, um, I think that <clears throat> as Americans, first of all, Trump is, is to me, is, he's a construct. He's a construct of our corporate media as well as most of our other corporate media reality. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, it's created. Um, and less and less, we have natural things like we're doing tonight, sitting around with something truly genuine, being able to create our own reality as the seconds mm -hmm. unfold, like right in this moment. Uh, I mean, less and less, you know, we, yeah. we, we hear people like you on NPR. You know, thankfully, you're right here with us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> but I, I travel overseas quite a bit, and, and there's good news overseas. There's good news in the, the industrialized, developed, educated world about taking technology as it exists in the 21st century, uh, high tech and low tech, all of mm -hmm. the above, and utilizing it for real human needs rather than this military empire that the United States is. Mm -hmm. And so we, one of our first uh, needs, I think, in, in the US, in our society, is to learn, <coughs> I could use other words, but learn Mm -hmm. Educate ourselves how how banged up emotionally and uh, societally we are. Mm -hmm. We're in rough shape here, mm -hmm. and, and it's not quite Trump certainly part of it, but it's 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 worse than that, and mm -hmm. it's becoming worse. It's, so it's this culture of violence, this language of violence that our government uses. Uh, and I could go on a long time about that. It's fair, I, I won't mm -hmm. do it now. I'd like to actually, but mm -hmm. it's, but the, when, when violence is the is the vocabulary of of action, then ev you know everything's possible, and mm -hmm. they want you to be violent. That's that's their language. They can, what they don't know is is how to do peace and cooperation. They, yeah. they don't know that. They're not good at that. So anyway, I just want to say, make a comment that um, the rest of the world is doing some amazing things. I mean, China has over ten thousand route miles of trains that mm -hmm. go between two and three miles a minute. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I ride them, and I ride mm -hmm. them with peasants sitting at mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say that in a very neutral way, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, but that's sort of who yep. they are, yep. <laughs> agrarian folks. Mm -hmm. And they, there's also lower cost trains that they tend to ride more commonly mm -hmm. on. But really, the mixing, there's a social mixing going on, there's an industrial mixing going on, there's a technological mixing going on. And, and this is taking, like, high tech as we know it, and applying it all over the place mm -hmm. to, to solutions. So it's possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I'm. I mean, I. To counter, I, I share your pessimism, um, certainly, and I and I don't think that a country like China necessarily holds holds a lot of hope. I think that yes, they have they have um, they have trains. They have more solar installed than we do. They they are, um, it, on by some markers, uh, doing a lot with technology. But on other markers, their their um, recolonization of Africa, the recolonization of Pakistan, um, is 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 horrendous, and I think indicative of a vast sucking up. They are dedicated to being the next world superpower. They may indeed already be the next the the world superpower, and we're just sort of in this echo bubble chamber where we think we're somehow a superpower. I think flying into any um, international airport or from any international airport and arriving in Logan or JFK, you see that you see what a backwards country we, we actually are. Um, I remember traveling from from Delhi to, to New York and you know in the, in the early 90s and it being such a radical shift and now to travel from Delhi, which has an incredible beautiful airport with wonderful food and, and air conditioning Subways. and to, to arrive yeah, in subways and to arrive at JFK, is 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 an eye opener and, and highly depressing. But I think that China is not um, as beneficent as well, well, as you might China say. Yeah. It's the implementation of technology. Mm -hmm. That's that's the point I want to make. Yeah. Yeah. What is actually possible? Mm -hmm. And it's it's our misguided allocation of our capital resources. Yeah. Complete. Yes. Misallocation. Yep. This is the problem. I think it's a problem. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, I, I, and I agree with you about Trump. I think that Trump is, I mean, I'm much more afraid less of Trump than what comes after Trump. 
what mm -hmm. comes, he's mm -hmm. breaking so many mm -hmm. of these checks and balances that we've all grown up with, that we've all been aware of for so long, and I worry about what comes after, because reality is he's an old man, he's, you know, either going to be impeached or left in, in disgrace on some level, but who comes in after him? Mm -hmm. um, I'm far more afraid of a, of a President Pence or a President Gowdy, um, Trey Gowdy, uh, or even a President Paul Ryan, or someone who we don't even know about, a strong man who, who his actions have opened the door for. So, yeah. can I, so, yeah. I, I have a question. That, that was oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, I mean, we have a question in the back, too. Yeah. Just, I'm just, can, you, can you just talk for a moment about how, well, you seem like kind of a radical guy, and you're teaching at Hassan. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, Hassan, it's a, I, it's a university now, and I know that they, mm -hmm. they're, they're very much trying to grow and grow and grow, 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 grow. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not the business school once uh, was, that yeah. it once was. So, can you can you talk a little bit about how, like, if you're if you're if you're willing to be radical, or you are radical now, mm -hmm. or if you consider yourself that way, how you how you can carry on at Hudson? Is, is it is it comfortable, or is it really touch and go, or what? Or? You want to answer that? Uh, <laughs> no, I won't. I won't bring you into it right now. Um, it, I think it's touch and go. I have no idea if, you know, I, I have a, a long-term contract there, but I have no idea that if I say the wrong thing or I write the wrong letter to the Bangor Daily News, I have no idea that, that the Board of Trustees is going to believe in, well, I know they're not going to believe in academic freedom and these sorts of things. I, it's, it's, um, I do think of the work that I do there as, as activist work directly because my students, for the most part, 50% of them, they're the their first first generation students, meaning they're the first in their family to ever go to university. Most of them, if not all of them, have never had any philosophical discussion in their lives, especially 20 years into this horrendous experiment with no child left behind in Common Core. Um, they have very few uh, critical thinking skills beyond being able to solve very simple simple problems. You know this as well. Teaching, teaching them, uh, the, the um, amount of creative thinking, of being able to creatively imagine a different world, and that's what I'm talking about, not just, not just you know, who is Plato or who is Nietzsche or, or Marx even, um, but actually being able to imagine a different world, a different society than one that has been laid out is deeply absent. So being able to provide that sort of thinking for them. I was called into the provost's office at one point uh, when they noticed that a lot of my students were, were dropping out sometimes. And, um, and they said, what's up? And I said, well, when they come to me and say they're upset at school, I say, well, drop out. Don't be here. Go and, go and find something else. Come back. My best students are always the ones who've come back, who've gone and be a bartender or done construction for six months or a year, and then they come back. And this, this to me is, you know, the obvious response, if you're unhappy in this situation, take action against it. And most of them can't. And far fewer, I've only had two or three who've, who've dropped out for any amount of time. Most of them have sort of just kept limping into my office every semester, complaining about being miserable, but not ever knowing how to take action to, to do that. So there, there is an activist quality to my work as far as whether or not Hassan supports that. I mean, it is a little bit in the shadows. I'm invited to teach philosophy and ethics, and uh, I've started teaching the first um, climate change uh, course there um, with another professor, and we have a lot of support, primarily because the other professor is, is more sober than I am, I think. Um, and I'm sort of the hysterical one in the room, and he, and he grounds everyone in, in, he's a physics professor, so he, he teaches math and really teaches calculations and things like that. Um, but we work well together. And so we're making inroads. We started the first, um, we sponsored the first group, uh, Students for Sustainable Justice. Is that a popular um, course? I'm sorry? Is that a popular course? Uh, it's becoming, is this only the second semester that we've run it? Uh, and we're, it's, it's fairly popular. Um, for 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 a place like Hassan, mm -hmm. uh, I found a similar. I mean, not to beat up on Hassan either. When I was teaching, I taught for a long time at the Honors College at UMaine and also in the Philosophy Department there. And I found the students, um, especially the Science and Technology students, to be as lacking in creative thinking and um, and and philosophical thought as as the Hassan students. So it's Hassan has a bad reputation. In fact. 
um, financially, sorry, I'll get to your question in just a minute. Financially, they, they, um, it's, it's often a financial choice for students to go there because they just, they haven't been told to get a general education or a liberal arts education. They've been told, go be a nurse, go be a physical therapist. If you get your doctor of physical therapy, you'll be flown around the country and you'll have, you know, a starting salary of $120,000. Say that to somebody from the county and it's of course what they want because they can't imagine another world outside. So you get some very intelligent students, I mean, straight A students who are, who are very committed, whether or not they're, they're radical, you know, um, after a semester with me, I hope to, I hope to get them thinking that way. But, yeah. I should say that uh, I'm very pleased that you're talking about climate change more so than what was uh, described in the newspaper. Uh, it, it, and you also mentioned just now about imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you ima can you imagine uh, in some the transition from the dominant economic present system to a uh, an economic system that would be you know uh, more integral with nature uh, and more uh, uh, beneficial to uh, the planet in general. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that transition? I. Uh, I mean, from an academic standpoint, of course, and the models exist, but for a, for a society of, of 7 billion committed to 9 billion, I don't see those existing except on the very small scale of a place like the peninsula or Brooksville or something like that. And I don't see it occurring without enormous amounts of pain happening to vast swaths of the rest of the population on the planet. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the, the, the refugee crisis, not just on our southern border, but in, but in, in, um, in, in Africa and Europe, the people are on the move. The, the reason they're on the move is precisely because of climate change. The Syrian conflict can be traced back to climate change. All of these, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Palestinian who was here, the Palestinian professor who was here, um, uh, last week, who was talking at your uh, Nazim, Nazim, yeah, he was talking about uh, about climate change as the as the underpinning of of the uh, of the Palestinian diaspora right now, as, as, and and what Israel was preparing itself for was climate change in a lot of ways. So I don't see these economic models kind of being more in touch somehow with. With the natural world, somehow you know the sustainable, uh, the the um, uh, what's the organization? The sustainable communities, uh, the uh, the transition towns, transition. transition towns. These sorts of things are, I think, a position of privilege. That yes, we can imagine them happening in Maine, but even in Maine, I wonder what happens when uh, when the fuel supply dries up. When you know, I I get maybe 20 to 30 percent of my vegetables from from a garden i'd like to get that up to 50 percent but that's not a whole lot and what happens when there's no food in in hannaford's and my neighbor who's armed to the teeth sees my garden you know it's it's in a bubble i can see it happening but given our present politics and our present illness i don't i don't know realistically how that happens i'm sorry to be such a downer you know i yeah you know it's something we should work towards yes absolutely your analysis that you know like the material physical level is you know it's flawless but i'm just wondering whether you know a different realm would be uh helpful in the sense of uh, a spiritual uh, an, uh, a, a consciousness mm -hmm. uh, and expanding. And uh, in other words, I, I can imagine the change that may come from sort of a different realm altogether. Yeah. I just, that's, I just yeah. wanted to offer that. Yeah, I think that's, I mean. I've seen you at the Sherry Mitchell gathering, so I mm -hmm. know you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I agree with your, your comment. I, I believe that Trump is the symptom, not the disease. 
And I think the disease that we have, George W. Bush actually articulated it once, and that was that we need to cure our addiction mm -hmm. uh, for, to foreign oil. Well, it's our addiction to more, our addiction to making America great again, making them more making everything larger. I just got back yeah. from France, mm -hmm. and those people have seemed to have discovered enough. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to do. Yeah, I had, a, I had a restaurant in New York City for a while with my sister, and, and very quickly we opened a, a bar next door, and we're looking to open a cafe next door. And it wasn't that we weren't making enough money, it was that this mentality of of being in New York is always expanding. Well, if you've got a successful restaurant, you've got to <coughs> franchise that, you've got to make it large, if not franchise, then at least expand it, turn it into, into various venues. Equally, I had friends who had a bistro in, in Marseille that they had inherited from their parents who had inherited from their grandparents that dated back to the late 1800s <coughs> when it had begun. And they'd had eight or nine tables in it. And they did a lunch and they, they sometimes did a dinner and they were very happy with it. And they, they, they got money, enough money to, to live a decent life. And I think that's that shift that you're, that you're talking about, this idea that somehow we, we should be getting more, we should be marketing more, we should be increasing our wealth, the, the idea of, 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 of growth rates. I was really interested when the, um, when the Bucksport Mill shut down a few years ago, I, it was, we were told that it wasn't profitable. Well, it wasn't profitable. In fact, I think they were making something like they were, had a growth rate of 3 or 4% year over year. No, that wasn't about profit. Well, yeah, and so, and, and, but that money could actually make much more money elsewhere invested in other things. So they impoverished or possibly impoverished Bucksport. Maybe they, they're coming back from it. But they were willing to impoverish a community in order to move the money to make more money elsewhere with no thought as to community or, or, or location. And I think that, that speaks to this, to, to this illness. Well, especially because you have a, 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 an economic system that depends on exponential growth. Yeah. And that just doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work and it can't work yeah. anymore in the, yeah. in the age of climate. To bring it back to the nearings, yeah. they specifically said they moved to the country not to make money, but to make time. Mm -hmm. but that they had more time together, more time to do the things they wanted, and they didn't worry about that other piece. It's kind of a nice sentiment. It's very nice, and I think it's why many of us stay on this peninsula or are drawn towards towards us, is, is, is having the time to work in a garden. I spend a lot of time working in my garden, and if I was somewhere else, I wouldn't have that time to spend in my garden, and, 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 it's, and it's a trade-off. You know, I make a I make a far lower salary at Hassan than I than I would make at, at another university, but you know, I have more time and, and that's very valuable to me.